Uh, my name is Sarah Jones, and I'm with the Parkinson and Movement Disorder Alliance, and we're an organization that provides extensive um, education and connection and resources to people uh, with Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders. And every month we do this uh, Lunch with Docs talk, and it's a... Um, it's a powerful way to be able to interact with a physician in a relatively casual setting um, online where we can see each other if you choose to have your video on, and if you don't, that's fine too, um, to get information about specific access or aspects of the disease. So we were talking briefly before we got started um, about where you can find these in case you want to go back and watch them again, or if you want to... Um, if you want to, uh, if you miss one and you want to be able to see it. So I am sharing my screen with you. And um, on my screen, you can see that we have a PMD Alliance YouTube channel. And this uh, YouTube channel has, oh, we have um, a whole bunch of videos. As you can see, these are all videos about Parkinson's disease, aspects of Parkinson's disease. Last I counted, I think we had maybe 35 or 38 videos. And we are actually specifically talking about one that Dr. Ospina did, which is in our list. And she did it early on in our time. She did it actually a year ago, Dr. Ospina. Oh, wow. It's been a lot. Uh -huh. Yeah, a year ago. Um, and she did a talk on um, REM sleep disorder and um, REM behavior disorder for Parkinson's disease. And as you can see, she's had 817 views. But you can go on this any time and watch all sorts of videos about Parkinson's disease and also learn a little bit more about our um, organization. If you just go to YouTube and type in PMD Alliance or Parkinson and Movement Disorder Alliance, you will find the, um, you will absolutely find the, the video. So I just wanted to let you know where to um, go. And if you've missed one or you want to catch up on ones you've missed or rewatch, you can always do that. So um, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Maria Cristina Ospina. She is one of our fantastic um, physician advisors and we're super grateful for her time and energy and expertise that she shares with us and with the community. Um, she is going to talk with us today a little bit about sleep and swallowing. And um, Dr. Ospina does such a nice job on question and answer that you can feel free to ask any questions you want. If at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat, a little chat button. And if you click that chat button, you can actually type a question in there and you can choose whether you want it to be private. If you want it to be private, you can send it just to me and I'll ask her for you. Um, and, and or you can send it directly to her too because she's in the chat. Um, and you can also uh, put it out to everyone. But I asked Dr. Ospina just to maybe start with talking a little bit about what are speech and swallowing issues tied to Parkinson's disease? And what do people need to be aware of? Both the person with the Parkinson's disease, but also the care partner. So as the disease is progressing, sometimes the care partner sees things that the person with Parkinson's disease doesn't necessarily see. So she's gonna just give us a little overview maybe of speech and swallowing issues tied to Parkinson's disease. And then, um, We'll open it up for some questions and answers. So thanks for being with us and taking your time over your lunch hour to be with us, Dr. Ospina. Sure, Sarah, always happy to help. I always enjoy um, talking to patients. Um, so, you know, speech and swallowing are something that's very, very common in Parkinson's disease. And especially the speech part of it, the hypophonia or the low whispery voice can happen before your diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Just like you can have that mass facies, you're not moving the muscles of the face as well. And you look at pictures and it looks a little bit different than it did five years ago. That hypophonic low whispery voice is very common common early on and may happen way before your tremor. And so, you know, in a spouse or a marriage that's, you know, 50 years old and they're, you're, they're thinking, oh, you're the one who has the hearing loss. That's why you can't hear me. And it's actually the patient who has hypophonia. And now they're not projecting their voice out very loud or very far. And so we have a speech therapy program that's called Lee Silverman Training Speech 
training or LSVT that helps you project your voice out louder and farther. Um, so that's usually about an eight week program and it's twice a week and it helps you do these exercises that help the muscles that control the vocal cords to make your voice louder. So the, the only thing with that is just like with any exercise is that one, if you keep it up, your voice is loud. If you just do the exercises during your LSVT training and then you go home, then the voice starts to, to dwindle again and get hypophonic or low and whispery. So one way to keep that up is, you know, here in Arizona, there's the tremble clefts and for the Spanish speaking patients, there's something called uh, Voces Unidas where you can go and sing with a group of people and it's a choir and it's kind of fun. You make friends and you sing it at different events and it keeps up those same exercises that you were doing in LSVT and it keeps your voice nice and strong. So then I guess, you know, we had a patient this morning, sometimes the insurance charges you $75 for every either PT visit or speech therapy visit. And so for eight weeks, it can be quite expensive. So we're kind of trying to game out, how could we get LSVT and not, you know, spend $3,000 doing these things. And then doing things like singing, uh, if you like karaoke, or joining one of these choir groups is one of the ways to get your LSVT in and not have to pay an arm and a leg for it. But hypophonia is very common in Parkinson's disease. Um, and so, and it's improved by, by this LSVT. Unfortunately, the medicines don't necessarily make your hypophonic voice louder. Uh, so it's something that we need to separately use the speech therapy for. The swallowing issues, there's two things that gets us into trouble in Parkinson's disease. One are swallowing issues that lead to choking and aspiration pneumonia where the food goes down the wrong pipe and two are falls that lead to broken bones. So we wanna be quite aggressive in preventing both of those things from happening. So that we're always asking you about your swallowing when you come in, have you had any choking episodes? Is there any coughing uh, with liquids or solids? And we're usually getting a swallow study if there's been any changes um, since your last visit. And what the, uh, the swallow study does is they have you swallow a graham cracker and some applesauce and then some barium that we can see under fluoroscopy and we can see how it goes down, down the esophagus. So we can see if there's any penetration, is any of that barium going into the lungs that would cause an aspiration pneumonia. And depending on what that shows, then we can change the consistency of your diet to make it less likely that you would aspirate the food, whether it's thin liquids, we use a th thickener, or we change the consistency of the food so it's easier for you to chew and then to swallow. Again, there's no specific therapy for a dysphagia or the trouble with swelling, but the medications like levodopa and your other medicines like Mirapax and Nupro and Requip, uh, just like they can improve your strength and uh, gain and balance, they improve initially the trouble swallowing, but they don't eliminate the dysphagia. Um, so we're always minimizing the risk by changing your diet if you're having trouble. Um, so, you know, we were talking earlier about peg tubes or feeding tubes. Um, early on in the disease, you know, if I've had a patient where they were losing a lot of weight, one because they had nausea from the medicine, they weren't eating well, they were depressed. And then those patients early on when they're cognitively intact, many times we've used a feeding tube or a peg tube to keep their weight back up, bring their weight up, bring it so that they can participate in physical therapy, get strong again. And then we take the feeding tube out. So usually it's three to four months. It's very unusual though. But if somebody develops dementia, then usually we don't uh, recommend a feeding tube because then we're just sort of prolonging their life with dementia. And all the feeding tube is preventing the choking episodes, but not the aspiration. So as you reach end stage, dementia, you're still aspirating the saliva that you are making, not necessarily just food, um, so that we're not really eliminating the risk of aspiration pneumonia at that time. And all we're doing by introducing a PEG tube is prolonging your life in that state. So it's important to have those discussions with your physician to let your physician know what, what you want to do. These are all very personal decisions. Some people absolutely don't want any peg tubes at any time whatsoever. And some people do want to have peg tubes. So, but it's important that your physician knows these things beforehand while you're still able to discuss them uh, with the doctor and ask questions and that you have these discussions with your caregiver and your family. So if there's a choking 
smoking episode or there's an episode of aspiration pneumonia and it's three o'clock in the morning in the ER, uh, your daughter, son, or spouse isn't trying to guess what would you want done at that time. Um, so it's something that the swan we always ask about. We want to be really proactive about it and prevent any episodes of choking or aspiration pneumonia. Usually what we tell patients is that we want to chew small little bites so that's easy to chew. We want to chew it well. We want to alternate liquids and solids so you're always washing it down with liquids. You always want to eat sitting upright and no talking while eating and that will minimize your risk of choking or aspirating the food. Uh, but those are, you know, two important things. So remember, choking episodes, things that lead to pneumonia, and then falls are the two main reasons why patients get into trouble with Parkinson's disease. Everything else, tremor, rigidity, we can pretty much handle with the medications and aren't going to get us into trouble. Uh, so we want to be very proactive in dealing with those things. And things like physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy helps, helps us with those. Uh, two things. So if anybody has any specific questions. I'm wondering, can you uh, share a little bit about why that, and maybe a little more in depth about, about why there are challenges with swallowing with Parkinson's disease? Is it tied to the brain and the messages? Is it actually the, the muscles or is it a mixture? Yeah, so remember that Parkinson's affects all of the muscles of the body. So it's just not the muscles of the arms and legs that help you with walking and balance, but it's all of the muscles, including your muscles of the gut. So I mean, one of the reasons patients have constipation, many times patients come in and they feel like, oh, you know, I started this medicine and now I have constipation and the constipation is from the medication. It's actually from the Parkinson's disease. So because all of the muscles of the body are now moving slower, so the, the gut is moving slower and then that leads to constipation. You, you suck more fluid out of the food and the food that still becomes hard and you become constipated. So we want lots of fiber to keep that gut moving, that food moving through the gut and lots of fluid to keep the stool soft so it's easier to evacuate. And so the same thing is happening with the swallowing. The swallowing involves about 23 different muscles and they all have to work in concert and in a certain sequence to do their job correctly. If it's slowed down, then the little flap that that closes off your windpipe closes too slowly and it gives a chance for the food or the liquid to get in there before it has a chance to close. Um, so it has to do with the Parkinson's and the fact that the muscles, the messages from the brain to the muscles are just moving slower. So we have kind of dial up instead of broadband. Um, but you know, the fact that you have gastroparesis or that, that means that the gut muscles moving slower all the way from the top to the bottom, you know, that impacts how well or efficiently your medicines work and how much on time or off time you have with during the day. So remember, you're taking your medicine as carbidopa, levodopa as a tablet or a pill, um, and then you swallow it and then that pill goes into the stomach, but it actually doesn't get absorbed until it gets into the small intestine. So if you have gastroparesis or slowing of the gut, then it takes longer for that food to go from the stomach into the small intestine. And so it takes longer for that pill to work. And many patients notice that as a delayed on or an off or just the pill by the end of the day simply didn't work because you've had too much off time. Um, so one way to deal with that is to use once a day medicines where we're not at the mercy of the gut motility or to use things like patches where the medicine is going through the skin and it doesn't matter what's in the stomach and how long it took to get out of the stomach. Uh, that's the other thing is that patients, especially patients who are taking medicines very close together, you know, they're levodopa every two hours, they notice that there's a competition between the protein in their food and the levodopa. Um, so that many times we'll want to get that levodopa in there first so it can get into the small intestine first and then go up and get used up in the brain and then the food comes in or the protein comes in after that. So, but one way to minimize that is to use these longer acting medicines, these once a day agonist uh, medicines like patches like Nupro that go through the skin and to use longer acting medicines like Ritari, Stelevo, Duopa, 
uh, where the duop was actually, a, we use a peg tube for duop and it goes right into the small intestine. We bypass that whole uh, gastroparesis, the stomach problem or the swallowing problems. Uh, but, you know, we always think of Parkinson's as tremor and rigidity, but we don't think of it that it affects the inner, inner muscles, the inner working of the body as well. And that can have quite an impact on how well your muscles, or how well your medicines work and how long they work. The other thing that we also use is DBS or deep brain stimulation. So that's an electrical way to treat the symptoms. You know, we put a stimulator deep in the brain and that way the thing is working 24 seven. It doesn't matter what you ate, when you ate it, uh, you know, whether you're constipated or not, it's still working. Uh, so there's many ways to get around this problem of gastroparesis or trouble with swallowing. One important thing about DBS is that many times, you know, it's important for patients to know, to realize what benefits they're going to get from the therapies, whether it's Duopa or DBS, that if you're going to have DBS, it's very good at controlling the tremor and eliminating on time with dyskinesia, but it's not necessarily going to improve your swallowing. It's not going to improve your hypophonic speech or make your speech nice and loud. It's not going to improve your freezing of gait. And so when you get a specific therapy, like a surgical therapy, like DBS, it's important to remember what we're, what we're trying to achieve and what is going to help and what it's not going to help. Um, so that we're still, even if you have DBS, even if you have Duopa, we're still going to be asking you about your swallowing every time you come in. Um, so I don't I, you That's think, really helpful. I mean, oh, sorry, it reminds us we're all connected, like head to toe. Head to toe, exactly. Uh -huh. And so and then, uh, another thing that helps with, with the swallowing and the constipation is exercise. So, you know, exercise helps you with the gut motility. It helps you uh, make sure that the food is moving from the stomach into the small intestine and it helps you with that constipation. So it's important that we're just not treating the constipation with fluids, fiber, and Miralax, but that we're adding an exercise regimen to that, that it helps both your motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, like strength and balance and gait and those sort of things, but it also helps non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's like constipation, mood issues, cognitive issues. Um, so I think it's, you know, one of the, we have a, a question. Oh, yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah, we do. We have a few. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, one is, what do I do if I think I've aspirated food? So usually with aspiration, if, you know, you know we, everybody aspirates a little bit every time at night, even pe people who don't have Parkinson's disease, we aspirate a little bit of saliva at night and then our immune system takes care of it. If you aspirate and then you develop a fever and this thing turns into a pneumonia, then we have to treat it with antibiotics. But, you know, if you were swallowing some liquid and you coughed and you choked a little bit and you think, oh, some of it went into the windpipe, but you don't develop any other symptoms, there's no fever, no other symptoms of something that we would consider pneumonia, then we would just leave it be. But certainly if you're a patient with Parkinson's disease and every time you're eating or you're drinking, especially thin liquids like coffee, tea, milk, um, then we would get a swallow study and see, you know, is it penetrating and how much? And is it somebody who could use a thickener uh, and then we could thicken your liquids and make you less likely to aspirate them and less likely to be at risk for aspiration pneumonia. So would it be, you know, that little, that cough, that little cough that isn't, you know, you think of pneumonia and you think of this huge cough, you know, in, in the general world, if we don't know a lot about pneumonia. So would one of those warning signs of there may be aspiration happening be that little kind of persistent yeah, so if, if you're always coughing, that's what we ask about coughing as well, not only just choking, but are you coughing while eating? That coughing means that the flap isn't closing quickly enough and stuff is getting through, and so that your body's trying to cough it back up. Uh, and so what we don't want it to is to become a frank choking episode. And so we want to keep an eye on that. We'd want you to you know, do the chin tuck maneuver, uh, those things that the speech therapist tells you about to help you with the swallowing that you're alternating liquids and solids, that you're chewing it up really well, and you're, you're taking very small little bites. But that, that coughing would be your very first Great. sign. And then, and then 
for Parkinson's patients, especially in end stage Parkinson's, many times it's not, you know, the first sign that you have that there's an infection in the patient is actually confusion and or hallucinations. So they haven't necessarily spiked a fever. They're not really complaining of burning on urination or frequency on urination. They've just become confused and maybe hallucinating. And then that happens from, you know, in, within a 24 hour period. And the first thing we want to look at is, is there an infection? Usually it's a UTI, a bladder infection, but it, the, you know, choice number two is pneumonia. So we always like to get a UA, some labs and a chest X-ray. Okay. There's another question, um, you know, this was in our, I think in our last e-news, um, we had an article about a product from Japan that they're creating to make it, um, foods into a gel to make it easier to eat. And the question is, are you familiar with that product or do you know anything about if that is coming to the United States? No, I don't know anything about that product. Uh, but anything that would make it easier for you, for your mouth to be able to feel it and swallow it, then that would be better. So, I mean, I, I don't know. It'd be interesting to see what kind of taste it has. Uh, I wonder if it's something like you made from tapioca, like those tapioca balls that you just sort of mush the food into that. Uh, so, I, who knows? That would be kind of interesting, though. Then the other question would be, is it covered yeah, by Medicare? I Right, right, exactly. I don't think from reading it, um, you know, before we put it in the e news, I don't think it's here in America yet. I, I don't know if it's coming to America, but, but it does make me think about the thickening, um, which is really what you're talking about. Same thing, whether it's going in food or liquid, um, the a thickening substance, right? Right. So most people hate the, th it's called like thick up. Most people hate it. They're like, oh my gosh, it's like drinking coffee with sand in it. Forget it. I'm not using it. Um, so, but you know, what we do in patients who have dementia, who are now losing weight because they're not eating, so they're afraid to swallow, you know, one of the things that happens once you've had one or two choking episodes, you're going to be just like you've had one or two really bad falls, you become really reluctant to get up and walk and the same thing to swallow. It's because, because now you're reluctant to swallow, you're not eating as much, you're starting to lose weight, you're becoming withdrawn because you're not going out with the family to eat socially. Um, so one thing we do in those cases is that, you know, we can, if the thick up is horrible, then we can use some ice cream or some, and then put some fruit in it for fiber and use it to put it into Insure or Boost or Carnation or any of those kinds of supplements so that we can keep up with your calories, make it thick and into a milkshake, something that you still can taste because you can still taste sweets and it's something you want to eat and you're less likely to aspirate it, but we're not running behind on your calories, your vitamins and your minerals. Uh, so, I mean, that's one of the things that we want to look for is that you don't become reluctant to eat and then start losing weight because you're afraid of choking on your food and because you're still eating the wrong, you know, they're still giving you steak and potatoes at the nursing home. Right, right, okay. Another question is, is it common that pills stick on one side much more than they stick on the other side? I'm assuming of the mouth. Not necessarily, but pills are, you know, the number one, if you ever ask patients, do you have trouble swallowing? They'll say, oh, I don't have any trouble with liquids or solids, but the pills, you know, yeah, the pills always get stuck. So what we do in that case, if it's not an ER version of a pill, if it's not a once a day version of a pill or a pill like Stilevo that we can't crush or cut in half, um, then, then we do crush it so that we crush the pills, we mix it with some applesauce or some yogurt or take the full pill or half a pill in yogurt and make it easier to swallow because you're swallowing it with the yogurt. You're just not trying to swallow that one pill that kind of dances around the mouth and goes here and there and never ends up where it needs to go. So that works well, uh, especially with medicines that are immediate release, like your cinnamon, your yellow cinnamon, but with medicines like Stilevo, which are sort of three pills in one, or anything that's extended release, then we can't cut those in half because it's no longer extended release once you cut it in half. Ritari comes as a capsule, and then you can open that capsule and put all the beads into your yogurt or applesauce. You just have to make sure that you've eaten the whole yogurt or whatever you put it in, that you eat the whole thing so you get the whole dose, that you're not missing half the little uh, beads in the yogurt. But that's something that we can do is modify how you take the pill or what kind of pill you take. 
great. Um, okay, and along that same line, how can I deal with someone who pockets pills in their mouth? Yeah, so again, I would try to take it with food. So yogurt, applesauce, and then just do one pill at a time and then you know, ask them to open their mouth, make sure that they've swallowed it before you give the next one so you don't have three or four pills um, stuck there. Again, you know, another, another reason to use patch forms of medicines, either for dementia or Parkinson's, so that we're going through the skin, we're not worried about pocketing, swallowing issues, or aspirating, choking on the pill. Great. Um, okay, so there's another question. A Parkinson's friend had surgery that packed his vocal cords and brought his voice back. We're familiar with this procedure, but not with Parkinson's. Can you comment on that? Do you yeah, know that so, procedure? So sometimes you can inject the vocal cords with collagen. Uh, and so it makes it easier for the vocal cords to close together and so that you can speak more clearly. Um, so that's a possibility. It's not commonly done, but it can be done. Uh, so it just sort of makes it, you know, I would say that we've had a few patients have it. It's I would say it's sort of 50-50 as far as how well it works uh, in Parkinson's disease, but that's, that's what it does. Again, it's not really going to change the swallowing either. Okay. Um, this is a great question. I've had a problem where my body creates an excessive amount of mucus. In the morning, it takes me two to three hours to get my head cleared. This includes gagging and clearing my throat. Have you encountered symptoms like this? And do you have any ideas about how to alleviate that problem of excessive mucus? So sometimes that can be caused by other medications that you're on. So one thing would be to have your primary care doctor take a look at your medicines and make sure that there isn't something there that's causing the excess mucus. Usually in Parkinson's disease, uh, what happens is that patients actually tend to have more dry mouth. Uh, and that with that comes more of a risk of dental hygiene issues like dental caries uh, and that they have drooling. And what is actually interesting is that you're not actually producing more saliva, you're actually producing less because you have dry mouth, but because you have swallowing issues, you're not swallowing as often as you used to, just like you're not blinking your eyes as often as you used to, you get that stare look. You're not swallowing as often as you used to. And so the saliva that you are producing tends to pool and drool out. Uh, and so there are several ways to deal with that. Uh, the easiest, cheapest way is to suck on a hard candy or a chew sugarless gum uh, that automatically gets you to swallow, even though putting something in your mouth will initiate saliva. But if you're swallowing it more often during the, during that, during the day, then it doesn't tend to pull out. At night, they can put a, a towel over the pillow so it takes care of the drooling then. We can inject your salivary glands with Botox, uh, and then that kind of shuts down the, the um, salivary glands. But one problem with that is, one, it's expensive. It can be painful. You have to have it done every three months. And if we inject the uh, submandibulars, what happens after a while, the body says, hey, these guys aren't doing their job, and it makes the parotids make more saliva, and then we're back to square one but it's something that is available for the use of silurea. Um, and then we can use some medicines to try to dry you up. Go ahead. To try to dry you up. But we don't necessarily like to use those medicines in Parkinson's disease because they have side effects of urinary retention and confusion. So always we wanna make sure do the benefits of the medicine intervention outweigh the side effects. Uh, so usually in our clinic, we end up with some hard candies and some sugarless gum, unless people want to go the Botox okay. route. Okay. And now those things, when you're thinking of the excess of saliva uh, or, and or the dry mouth and swallowing issues, all of those things are not early on in the disease, correct? Like they wouldn't be something, if somebody says, wow, I have a dry mouth, and I have sometimes I aspirate, but has no other symptoms. That's not necessarily an early sign of Parkinson's disease. No, not at all. So, so early signs of Parkinson's disease are things like constipation, although many people are constipated for many other reasons, not just Parkinson's, but most people who get diagnosed with Parkinson's have been constipated already for five or more years. Restless legs. 
So same thing, most people with Parkinson's have restless legs, but not everybody who has restless legs will go on to develop Parkinson's disease. REM sleep behavior disorder. So that's when you act out your dreams, you're no longer paralyzed during REM sleep. So that can be quite common in Parkinson's disease and present five, 10 years beforehand. Uh, and that does have a high correlation with Parkinson's disease. So it can be, I think, almost up to 70% of patients with RBD develop some form of Parkinsonism. And then a loss of sense of smell. So not everybody who can't smell anything is going to develop Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease, but most people with Parkinson's or Alzheimer's have already lost their sense of smell. So those are, you know, early, you know, when people come into the clinic and it's sort of a question mark of, we don't know if they have Parkinson's disease or not, and they don't really have a tremor, and they might have a little bit of bradykinesia, maybe a little bit, of, but not enough motor symptoms to make the diagnosis. Then I often look at these other things. Do they have constipation? Do they have RLS? Do they have RBD? Uh, do have they have lost their sense of smell? And then all of those point more to, yes, maybe we should get a DAT scan uh, and, and really see if they have Parkinson's disease or not. Uh, but no, dry mouth is very common. It can be caused by many, many things, including medications. So not everybody who coughs or chokes or has dry mouth is going to develop Parkinson's disease. Excellent. Um, there's a comment here. My neurologist has never mentioned these things to me. Um, and I will uh, send this back to you, Ospina, Dr. Ospina, in a minute here. But um, uh, one thing I would say is that a lot of people don't know that there are, of course, we have primary care doctors, and then we have neurologists, which, of course, have additional training in neurology. But there are I don't even know. Dr. Ospina could tell us how many dozens and dozens of uh, conditions a general neurologist is treating. Um, and so there's many, many conditions that they're treating. Then there are neurologists who have had advanced training in movement disorders. And those uh, neurologists are called movement disorder specialists, like Dr. Ospina. And um, Parkinson and Movement Disorder Alliance, we partner with movement disorder specialists because they have had the most advanced and extensive training specifically in movement disorders. And um, I'll have maybe Dr. Ospina talk about the prevalence. I think that Parkinson's is certainly one of the most common movement disorders outside of maybe essential tremor. Um, but um, we really encourage people, if you see a general neurologist, if you live in a town where there aren't movement disorder doctors, um, we really encourage people to at least annually get an evaluation from a movement disorder doctor all of the different things that Dr. Ospina has spoken about today really give you that breadth of understanding of the, the knowledge of a movement disorder doctor and the things that they know to look for and the medications that they know you can put together to make, um, you know, to help with quality of life. And they just have a, have a far advanced um, understanding of, of movement uh, disorders and Parkinson's disease. We do maintain a list of our advis advisors on our website, but if you live, I know we have people actually from all over the country right now on this call. Uh, and so if you live in a place where you don't know if there's a movement disorder doctor in your area, you can always reach out to us at info at PMD Alliance, and we will help you track down a uh, movement disorder uh, physician and, um, and I always say it's not cheating on your other doctor. It's not cheating on your general neurologist. This is your health care. This is your life. And um, it's always a good idea to have a, a, you know, a specialist in your corner. But do you want to talk a little more about maybe movement disorder doctors? I know this wasn't something we were going to talk about, but I think it's really important, especially when you're looking at really you know, issues like what we're talking about today. Yeah, so as a movement disorder neurologist, yeah. I would say... So 80% of our practice is Parkinson's disease. That's by far the most common movement disorder that we're seeing in the clinic. And then we see other things like dystonia, Huntington's disease, essential tremor. But I would say most of my day, like my entire morning today was all Parkinson's patients. Um, so we feel very comfortable treating Parkinson's patients. Uh, we program the DBS unit, so we feel comfortable with that. We do Botox. Um, so it's something that we, we're we always dealing with. Um, and I think that, that to, you know, today, even though Parkinson's today is a chronic disease, something that you live with, like diabetes, no longer something that you die from, 
you know, outside of dementia, the two things that gets us into trouble, the two things, the reasons patients end up in the ER are falls that lead to broken bones. So we want to make sure, you know, as we're adding in new medicines, as we're making this cocktail of medicines, are we making you orthostatic? Are we, you know, all of these medicines are lowering your blood pressure. So is that one of the reasons why you're having falls? Are you standing up and getting dizzy and falling because of low blood pressure? Or is it, are you standing and, and having freezing of gait and then falling over? Or is it just poor balance? And so that we want to be careful that we can prevent those things and we don't make we don't actually make them worse by adding more medicines or changing the medicine mix and that the other part of that is the swallowing that you're not choking on your food that we're keeping an eye on that the consistency of the food and that we minimize your risk for aspiration because we know that those those muscles are already moving slower they're not in in sequence that that we would like them to be and the slower they move the more the risk that that flap takes too long to close and you either choke because it gets stuck there and we can't cough it back up or you aspirate a significant amount of either liquid or something else that causes, that then turns into a pneumonia that ends up as a hospital admission. So we want to be proactive in preventing the two things that we know are gonna to lead to hospital admissions. The dementia part of it uh, is a little bit more difficult because we don't really have any medicines that stop or reverse the cognitive decline. Um, so with that, we always wanna make sure that patients are always planning ahead should that happen. And that is not true just for Parkinson's patients, but for all of us, you know, all of us should have discussions with our family or caregivers and our doctors of, should we want a peg tube, you know, should something happen or should I develop Alzheimer's or should I have a car accident? Uh, do I want to live on a respirator? Do I want to live with a feeding tube? And the earlier these decisions are made, the easier these th transitions will be if they have to happen and the less stress your family and caregiver is going to have at the time of, of, of the event. So, I mean, we always ask patients about swallowing and we're getting, you know, if there's any issues, we're always getting. I mean, I, would, I think that a modified barium swallow outside of physical therapy are probably my most ordered things in the clinic. And it's a, it's a exam that's done in the hospital because we need a flu, fluoroscopy to, to take a look at it. So it's always done at a hospital and it's outpatient. And basically it's not painful. All you do is the speech therapist has you um, eat a graham cracker, some applesauce, and then a white barium. And then they watch it go down. Uh, it's kind of cool to see if you, if they'll let you see it on the monitor and it's kind of cool to see you, you see all your bones and your teeth and your, you know, everything is kind of neat. So if you're a person with Parkinson's disease um, and maybe you've had it for a little while, it might be a good idea to be able to go in and, and have one of those tests done if you haven't. I think if you're having um, issues, so, I mean, if you're not coughing while eating, either liquids or solids, then, you know, most likely you're not having any aspiration. Uh, but if you're having coughing episodes, especially multiple times, so it's almost every time you eat or it's every time you have thin liquids like coffee, tea, or milk, or every time you eat dry food like toast, you're having some trouble, then we would get a swallow study. Just, you know, we'd like to get a baseline, and then if there's any changes from there, we can see if there's been any changes. But, you know, once you've had these studies, then it kind of clues you into what do I need to look for, the speech therapist educate you on safe swallowing techniques. Uh, and so many times, even though patients have had a change and I'll say, okay, well, I'll order another swallow study. They're like, no, 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 I already know what I need to do. I just need to do it. Uh, so that they, they know that they're not supposed to eat big cubes of steak <laughs> and, and then talk while eating and then boom, they've aspirated a big chunk of meat. So that's great. So um, yeah, don't do that. Don't have a big cube of steak if swallowing is, is difficult. Right. Even with people without swallowing, that can be a... a exactly. I think that the, the thing that gets people into trouble is the talking about I, eating part. Yes, I was thinking about that. That's hmm, that's a good one. I, and we've, we've had a couple times at our get-outs where people have had a difficult time, um, you know, swallowing because they're visiting. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a good thing to be aware of. Someone said that, uh, so there's a question. I've been told that tucking my chin in when swallowing helps. 
Yes, yeah, so that's just called the chin tuck maneuver. It's one of the things the speech therapy educates you about how to swallow. So, you know, they say that the small little bites, to chew it up really well, alternate liquids and solids, always eat sitting upright, no talking while eating, and then you use this chin tuck to make sure that it's getting swallowed all the way down. But I mean, I always like patients, I always have a therapist visit with, go ahead. No, no, you always have a speech therapist, go ahead. Right, right. so they always have a speech therapy consult so that you know, they have somebody there talking them through what's going wrong with the swallowing and how can we minimize the aspiration risk. And then they can give them tips. Okay, yeah, okay. yep, that's what I mean. As well. So, and any speech therapist is, is qualified to do that, correct? They don't the have to be a part study. of instance trained. So. Right, so it's not like LSVT, which is a separate certification for a speech therapy that's specific for Parkinson's disease. Um, all speech therapists are going to be doing modified barium swallows. Okay. Uh, here's a question. My husband chokes on ice cream. What about ice cream? What is it about ice cream that makes it difficult to swallow? I know, so there would be something specific to him. So, but, you know, there's a, a subset of patients. Some can't have thin liquids and they need a thickener and the other can't have thickened liquids. So we, that's what the barium swallow shows us. So like some people can use straws and some people can't. And so depending on your, what, where the malfunction is, then the speech therapy says, no straws for you, straws for you, thickener for you, no thickener for you. Uh, but usually, you know, we, we, they end up needing more thickened liquids. Great. There, you know, there was a question about falls in here. And so I will put falls specifically on one of our Lunch with Docs talks. But earlier on, you did mention, you know, you were talking about the whole digestive process and that the whole process needs to work because if it doesn't, if it gets slowed up down in the gut, then everything else gets slowed even, you know, back up. So I'm not necessarily saying that falls are tied to swallowing issues, but falls can be tied to the digestive tract. Is that right. true? So, and, so falls and are, Yeah, so falls are tied to your off time. So the more off time you have, the more Parkinson's you have, the more rigidity, bradykinesia, that slowness of movement, the more poor balance. So if you're taking your medicines, but it's just sitting in the stomach and it's not going anywhere, it's not going into the small intestine where it needs to be absorbed, then you're not getting the therapy, you're not going on. And the, the longer you're off, then the longer you have that freezing of gait, uh, that freezing of gait puts you at risk for the falls. Um, and so that, you know, that's one of the reasons that we wanna treat the constipation, we want to minimize your gastroparesis increase your on time so that you don't take a pill and it takes 45 minutes for that pill to kick in. That you take your medicines before it wears off so that you're not peaking and troughing, peaking and troughing all day long. And then the more that you're in the trough, the longer the off times are gonna be. So, you know, if you take your, if you're off and then the longer you wait to take that next dose of medicine, the longer it takes that dose to kick in. During that period that you're off, your swallowing is worse, your speech is worse, your gait, your balance, all of them are worse, putting you at risk for falling, for aspirating. Uh, so, you know, our job is to try to get you as much on time as we can. It's the reason that your doctor's discussing these once a day dopamine agonists, even though the three times a day are generic, you know, because it actually makes a difference. So your normal brain gives you a continuous, you know, dopamine, throughout the 24 hour period. It gives you a, you know, a continuous dopamine tone. It doesn't pulse you up and down, peak and trough, multiple every three hours the way cinnamon does. So the more we can use medicines that work like the normal brain, the more on time, the more you'll feel like your old self. Um, so it may be the reason that why your you know, doctor discusses things like Stilevo and things like Ritari, things like Duopa, we're trying to stretch out that on time as much as possible and minimize these off periods, which can lead to these falls and swallowing issues. Great, and I'm gonna ask one and then we probably have time for one more question um, beyond this one. So there's a question of, do I need to track uh, difficulty in my swallowing or my coughing 
to bring that information to my doctor's appointment? No, I think all you need to say is, oh, gee, I've noticed that I'm having more coughing or choking episodes while eating, and that will immediately trigger a swallow evaluation. So we don't, we don't want to wait until your first Heimlich for them to say, for you to bring it up with your physician and say, hey, let's do a modified barium swallow. So that we want to be proactive. Any little bit. So even, and so perhaps if a person, uh, if, if a care partner is watching and they have not had that conversation about, hey, do you ever notice that you choke on food and really have that conversation with the person with Parkinson's, just to sort of bring that to the surface in case that hasn't somehow come up in conversation or if you're not seeing a movement disorder specialist that may or may not come up. Right. And then the other thing would be, you know, when are these episodes happening? Is it always happening as your medicine is wearing off? You know, are you eating and you're, you're wearing off and that's when the aspiration or the coughing and choking is happening? Then we know, oh, all we do need to do is increase your on time and make sure you're eating when you're on and not waiting until the very end of your dose to minimize that risk. Um, so, you know, always we want to make sure that's why you're doctor is always asking you also not only what you're taking and how many milligrams, but what time. You know, we're always interested in what time are you taking your cinnamon because we need to know is your dyskinesia, is it peak dose or is it diphasic? Does it come because it's too much medicine or is it too little medicine? And the same thing, you know, are you having problems with off periods and that's just an off period problem or you're choking regardless whether you're on or off. Great. Um, there's a question about what thickening things work, work well. And what I'll ask is if somebody ha is listening and has a thickening agent that has worked really well that the person who's using it really doesn't uh, notice the flavor, doesn't seem to mind the flavor, feel free to send that to us at info at pmdalliance.org. And we'll make sure to put that in this recording when it goes live too. Um, that way we can, you know, there's many different options, but if there's something that you've found that works pretty well and seems palatable for people, uh, let us know. Well, I cannot thank you enough. I want to make sure to give you a few minutes here before your next patient to be able to let you have a bite to eat. We're so grateful for you spending your lunch hour with us and what a great amount of information about swallowing, such an important topic for people with Parkinson's disease and, and actually many movement disorders. Mm -hmm. Sure, anytime. Always, always enjoy it, Sarah. Thank you so much, Dr. Ospina, and thank you all for joining uh, this talk. Um, th this is a part of our NeuroLife Online program, and we have a pretty comprehensive extensive program um, online for people to access anytime. If you want to learn more about it, you can visit that on our website at, at the same place you found this link, www.pmdalliance.org. And um, we will take this and put this right up on YouTube. It sometimes can take up to a week, but um, we will get it on YouTube and then we'll probably highlight it also in our next e-news, which we'll send out in the beginning of September. So thank you so much for uh, being with us today, and we'll see you next month the, uh, for the next Lunch with Docs um, on the fourth Wednesday next month. Thank you all.